was supposed to be Jacqueline Freeman. So for a moment, imagine me, uh, tall, blonde, willowy, extremely self-confident, uh, living in her own private world and doing miraculous things in the big world. Okay, then send her out. Goodbye. She's not here. I'm here. The night before we were supposed to come here together, she said, I, I can't make it. And I have an hour to fill. So would you please speak? So I went, okay. So here I am speaking. So it's been really fun to listen to what everybody's talking about. I've tried to kind of uh, use some of that information to put together what I'm going to talk about today. Um, the first thing I'm going to say is, um, is um, I took a lot of water because in 1988 I was uh, diagnosed with metastatic head and neck terminal cancer. So, okay, does that work? Yeah. Okay. So, start over. Start over. So the whole last paragraph. up here with my microphone. Um, first, um, I come from the Pacific Northwest. I'm an author and a technical editor by trade and a beekeeper by avocation. I've been learning from Jacqueline Freeman. I've had none of the problems with bee clubs that everybody else has because I just work with hooey wooey people all the time and, and we just never address all those different aspects. Um, I want to begin by saying that I sip a lot of water and uh, I pop pop my words. I get caught in mouth all the time. I was radiated on the head and neck 20-something um, years ago, so I don't have any salivary glands, so I do a lot of sipping. Now, the other problem I've had all my life is I'm a chronic stutterer. So if I'm really belaboring a word, blah, 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 and you know what it is, just shout it out and we can go faster. All right. First, I'm going to begin with a kind of ode to Jacqueline and Laura Ferguson, who are who are not here. I will say that uh, years ago, when I was a belly dancer in Jackson Hole, um, the the, uh, the cowboy bar uh, had Waylon Jennings come come in, and I was like, I was so jazzed, my God, a big name in Jackson Hole, and there were like no people there at all. So Waylon Jennings shows up. For his first 25 minutes, he sings the same song over and over and over. Then he passes out drunk, and that's the end of this big, expensive event. So, a few months later, Willie Nelson comes, and he said, For my friend, Waylon, who didn't do right by you, I'm staying here till 2 a.m. You can get up and dance. So I'm saying, for my two friends who freaking bailed on me on this, I don't know why, um, I am, I'm going to just bring a little bit of them here to kind of honor them. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, I learned how to do Brahmery chanting from Laura Ferguson. Laura, as you probably know, or if you don't, uh, has really made a study of women in bees from the very, very ancient times. And the first people really associated with bees and beekeeping were women. They were priestesses called the Melissa. They were the oracles. It was believed at that time that the sound that the bees made was the sound of the universe just before it came into being. That that was the sound called the unstruck sound. And then the women carried the frame drums, and that was the struck sound. And women were the first beekeepers and the first frame drummers. And it was believed that their oracle abilities came from bee dreaming and bee chanting. And so we're going to do a little bit of brahmery this morning for uh, Laura Ferguson. I haven't ever heard this in a room before, so I'm really jazzed. This is how you do brahmery. You're essentially going to be making the sound of a bee. So what I want you to do is, it's a sound that's in this part of your throat. So to get in touch with that, put your head back, stick your tongue way out, and make the sound of kind of a high E. Okay, you got, now feel that, where that is. Okay, now, very good. Now, no, no, really. Now, shut your mouth. <laughs> and, uh, 
and we're going to do it, okay? And we're going to go for like maybe a minute. So you, you close your mouth now, and you will be going, and just, just go, take, take a breath, go some more. Jacqueline. Um, I, uh, I was stung by uh, bees when I was young and I blew up like a balloon so I always assumed that I was allergic to them, which I now know I'm not. I just had a, you know, bad normal reaction to a sting. So, for some reason, bees just kept coming into my mind when I moved back to the Northwest five years back. So, on a birthday, which my birthday happens to be today, <laughs> So, um, so on my birthday, my ex-husband sent me 175 bucks. He's a real dear. So I thought I'm going to do this. I'm going to do something fun with this. And I found this program called Sacred Beekeeping out at Jacqueline's farm. And we had uh, Mikhail Tealy there, and he went very deep into the kind of zeitgeist of the bee. And one of the processes he did with the 20 of us was he took us up in front of Jacqueline's hive. She has them kind of plopped all over the place. And he put us in front of one hive in a field. And we were all standing kind of staggered behind it. And he went in front of it. And he did some sounding. And he mostly did vowels. And he just made these vowel sounds that are yogic and I don't understand at all. But when he did that, all the bees came out. There were just hundreds if not thousands of bees just coming out of the hive. And they came around us and they swirled around us and they were so close you could, with your eyes closed, feel the little wing bee puffs against your face. And they drifted in clouds and circles and they hummed. And that was the first time I heard that hum surrounding me. And I don't, I believe that the hum, the vibration that the bees hum, is a healing tone. There's a lot of stuff about sound and healing, and I think that's one of them. So when the bees finally quietly went back into their hive, we all looked around at each other. All of us were crying. It, it was just such a moment. So my next moment was I started to go to classes, and I got a call for a cutout. I knew nothing about cutouts. It was near my home. I'll show up. Three guys go up, they're doing a cutout in a church eat. It was, um, the hive had been there for nine years. It stretched the entire length of a very large old church, 20 feet up on scaffolding. And they said, you can be the one who puts the comb into the hives. So they brought along a top bar hive. And all the guys were up there, and they didn't care that I didn't know anything. They just started passing um, tubs, five-gallon buckets, of comb down to me. And I said, what, what do I do? And they said, just tie this up onto these top bars and then put them in the hive. Okay, so I'm there, I have no gloves <coughs> on, I've got a bee jacket. They estimated that that hive was a, probably about an 80,000 bee hive, it was huge. And I, I get my first bucket, I'm totally besotted, I'm in this and it's like, okay, what do you do with this? So you pick up a piece of comb that's out of a hive. It's covered with Lord knows how many bees. And they're like Dolly's watches. Right? They're so soft. And so I'm trying to maneuver these things in my hand. And I, I found a napkin holder in the church. And I would like set the comb in the napkin holder and then hold the little bar on top and then try to do twine and tie, tie it in. I will never do that again. I, I mean, that's, just, that's just plain nuts. Because what you wind up with is this wonky, flopping mass that the bees have to then deal with. Like, what did you do to 
those. And, and when you try to stack them, they don't stack right, they're crosswise. But that day, we worked for hours, just nonstop, all day, and I'm in this hum of bees. I got stung maybe five times. I must have handled 50,000 bees. And I went home, and I was just, <laughs> oh, my, man, I had the buzz. I was like, oh, bees, bees. And I've just been besotted with bees ever since then. So, so I just ten, attended more of Jacqueline's classes, and then Jacqueline told me about the book that she was, had been wanting to write for four years. Jacqueline is way, way right brain. She lives in her own time world, okay? So she had all the material and not a clue how to put it together. And you, you couldn't hold her on task for 10 minutes at a time. She's like, oh, I got my paragraph. Oh, how about for the little girl? Look at this book. Oh, I should go out and look at my piece. Jacqueline, come back here. So I, I corralled her for six months and she wrote her book. And, and the person who thanked me first was her husband, Joseph. <laughs> and he said, Susan, she's been wanting to do this for five years. I've been trying to help her, but you're the only person that she listens to. So we got, the, got her book out, um, uh, the song of Increase, and it's beautiful, and she wanted me to bring copies here, but of course I didn't have any, and here, here I am. So I wanted to address Earlier, address a couple things. We, um, I'm from the Pacific, the Pacific Northwest, and so we have basically very docile, laid back kind of cool bees. You know, they're like Portland bees, man. They're, they're, they're <laughs> bees. They're just like they're in the flow. Yeah, and plus, there's lots of cannabis plants for them to land on, and you know, pull all that lovely trichrome stuff off of because it grows everywhere. Um, and Jacqueline recommends that in the Northwest we all have our hives under some kind of cover. She has hers in a big gazebo that she got free on Craigslist, so it's all that gazebo roofing. So she says get them off the ground at a, a considerable distance and get them under cover. So I have this extension built into my bee yard and uh, that's my undercover. I call it the Bee Parthenon. And, uh, and this is kind of in interesting. This thing here is a section of hollow log. And I put the lid on it and I put detritus in, in the bottom of it, leaves and you know, shredded old wood and things for a kind of an echo floor. <coughs> and this year I wanna I wanna put a swarm in there. Um, our bee group uh, has certain tenets that we kind of teach and sort of live by. So I was going to talk about some of those today and, and what they meant to me in my experience learning about bees. I'm only five years in, so like I'm a newbie, and uh, for the first day here, I was thinking, I'm just going to donate my time to like Michael or to Dee because like this is way stupid for me to be up here. But as you can see, I really love to talk, so I just wasn't going to give it up. So here I am. Um, I, uh, I'll show you the yard. This is what a lot of Northwest yards look like. It's just uh, yes. like this. It's just a lot of stuff growing. This is my kind of like giant weed bin. All of the stuff on the ground that's green is weeds. The tree up there was a uh, hazelnut planted by Chipper, the, um, the squirrel that lives in my yard. Uh, got lots of native foxgloves and all that kind of thing. So we're, we're really blessed. But we have a our season there is we have a lovely nectar production in the spring. The Himalayan blackberries are our big flow. And once the blackberries are done, we go into a fairly extended dearth. We can have problems if we have a late wet spring. It looks like you have flowers, and it looks like there's lots of pollen, but the bees can't get out to it. And if it's not dry for more than a couple of days, you know, the sources are just no good. They're just too rain saturated. So we can end up needing to feed in shoulder seasons with that. Jacqueline has never had a problem with uh, being a, a, a totally woo-woo bee person. And, and all the people that she teaches, she talks to them um, expecting that it, it's okay that they will understand that she channels bees. She comes from a long line of 
uh, women mediums. And um, she sits down, and every now and then she'll say, oh, you know, it's coming up. And her husband will sit down and start writing. And uh, what he writes down and what she says, it's not her speaking voice. She's kind of like some, somewhere else. And as we were putting the book together, what was exciting for her, for going back through the years and kind of looking at all the conversations from the bees and what the bees were saying, is there were things in there that there were words she didn't un understand and we started looking them up in books and realizing that she was just totally and completely right on with what the bees were telling her before she ever, ever knew it. And let's see, let me find my little slide thing. Take a, like a two minute break and yak with each other. <laughs> Show your bee pictures to the person next to you. Okay, right. <laughs> designed to take people through their first year of beekeeping. So I was looking for something that might be appropriate to share with this group, and one of the classes that we do is called How to Be a Bee-Centered Beekeeper. We play with words all the time. What do we do? Is it natural beekeeping? Um, Jacqueline uses the word relational beekeeping. Um, I know that Corwin Bell talks about being, becoming a bee guardian. There's lots of different words in which um, 
we backyard hive, uh, more natural type people are trying to come up with catchphrases for what we do. So somehow we can make something hook and stick. So we've been talking about bee-centered beekeeping, which means uh, putting, putting the bee first. And we believe that when you step into beekeeping, one of the things as you're doing the planning that you might start to consider, because it will guide all of your other choices, certainly in your first year, is what kind of beekeeper do you want to be? And I don't mean the obvious stuff like, well, do you want to do treatment or not? <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about stuff like, do you think you're going to be a person who wants to futz around in the hives a lot? Are you an engineer? Are you going to want to be putting tools in and doing a lot of measurement? Are you a person who wants to be completely hands off and just have the bees in your yard to have them and to observe them? Are you thinking of maybe taking honey? Are you thinking of products from the hive? Uh, the way that you decide to define yourself as a beekeeper will help direct all of your decisions for the next year. If you say, I am a treatment-free beekeeper with a bad back, so I need uh, alternative hive styles, I think I'm going to want to mess with them some, but I'm not sure. Um, honey is no big deal to me, uh, but you know, down the line, that would be nice. Um, I don't think I want to interfere with my bees a lot because, you know, I know that they don't like that. Well, then all of a sudden, when things come up, and, you know, write that down and post that in your bedroom or something. This, this is what I'm about with bees, especially in this first year. If you're treatment free, then you don't have to worry about creatures in the hive or anything else. It's like, well, that's taken care of. You know, if you decide you've got a bad back, you don't have to worry about hive lifts and stacking boxes or finding handsome young men who can do all your lifting for you. It's like, okay, if I'm not using those hives, then that defines the types of hives that I'm going to have. If I'm a person who wants to do very, very little intervention and just have something that bees kind of really like, I might just set up a worry with three boxes and just let it go. Um, if you're a person who wants to be extremely uh, um, explorative, uh, generally, I would recommend, you know, get the same hive style so you can do swaps. But a lot of people want to try lots of different things before they light on any particular thing. So if you're the type of beekeeper who says, I think I'm going to be a bit of a, oh, what's the word, you know, Cortez, I'm going to be an exploratory beekeeper. You might want to look at different hive styles and try maybe a couple few and take your time and see what you kind of come home to. But I think if, if, if you sit down with yourself and honestly say, you know, wh what do I think it's going to be about? S start somewhere, because the information coming at you is so vast. It's like, oh, i got to get my cells down small. Oh, oh, but I don't want to have to have to break my back. Oh, but the bees don't like being bothered. Oh, how do I keep this warm? Oh, conversation. Oh, 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 oh. And you go out of your mind. So decide kind of at the first, for my first year, I think I'll, I'll, I'll stick to this and then go with that. And that way a whole lot of your decisions become a whole lot easier. So I love this slide. Bees simply don't have big enough brains to do all the things they do, and yet they do them so well. <laughs> Bees have been serving us for tens of thousands of years. Maybe in beekeeping we could consider how we serve them. And that's what all of you are really here for. So when we do classes, the first thing we do is we pass out kind of a larger handout than this, and we say, this is what we do. This is what we do, and this is what we believe. And depending on how you want to keep bees, you can work this into it. First, obviously, I don't have to talk about treatment-free because you all know that. And we talk to people about treatment-free, and they're very glad because these are more people who are inclined toward conscious living and it makes sense to them. Like Jane Goodall said, when did we decide it was a good idea to poison our food? <laughs> yeah, so a lot of people who come to us are like, when did we decide that was a good idea? I don't want to treat the bees. I don't want the stuff in my body. I don't want it in the bees' body. We're real sticklers on natural comb. 
and we're sticklers on natural comb for a reason. First of all, bees will find their way to these smaller size combs and they have a chance to make what they want to make. I've been doing an awful lot of reading about bee communication on the comb. If you look at a piece of comb, you'll realize that the surface of it, if you hold it up like this and look, the very outer edges of those cells have almost a slight thickening around them. That's totally connected across the entire web of that comb. A lot of what we think of as bee dances and bee movement zipping across the comb is actually the bees moving, um, holding on. They grip those little edges with their little bee feet and they, they rush their body forward and they rush it back and they rush it forward and they rush it back. And they're actually shaking and manipulating that web. All the other bees in the hive can have a sense of that. The communication is vast. Bees are all about communication. I just feel if you put foundation in, how do the bees talk to each other? I don't know about you, but I was in bed for several years because of stress and fatigue problems and all of those sorts of things. Stress is killing our bees. And so in bee-centered beekeeping, we're looking at the system going, what can be most stress-free for them? Like I was, you know, crying to Michael about, you know, how come, how come the world is poisoned and what can I do? Well, I don't know really all what I can do about that, but in the areas that I have control over, how can I take as much stress out of the bee lives as possible? So one of the ways we take the stress out is we let them build their own comb. Bees also use their comb as a, uh, that's how they set up the ventilation in their hives. So I'm just going to put this out there. Um, I'm starting to ask myself about us making bees build straight comb when they choose not to. I mean, you know, you pick up the bottom of a worry box and look in and you'll see just all these shapes and it's exquisite. There's this wonderful, organic, sensual look to it. And the bees don't do it because it looks like artwork. They do it because that's how they want to move air in that hive, in that place. And if I keep trying to force them straight, well, yeah, they'll be able to manage the ventilation, but don't you think it's kind of stressful? So when I work my hives, which I try not to do a lot because I'll get to that, um, if I need to see what I need to see, I might have to go in and lift out six bars together on a top bar hive because they're interconnected. And then I can look down in there with my handy little macro magnifying visor and I kind of separate the comb a little bit and usually you can see what you need to see and I can put it back. So I'm kind of all about letting letting bees do what it is that, that, that bees do. So we teach our people, let them draw their own comb. Uh, of course, natural food, and I have to talk to you about that. We really push the honey. All the people that we talk to in their first year are like, where, where do I get that honey? I mean, if I want to feed the bees, if I have to feed my bees, where do I find the honey? So we send them out, and they're all appalled by what the honey costs. But as a first-year beekeeper, you really have to struggle sometimes getting your hands on comb and getting your hands on honey. But the bees, bless their grateful, sacrificing hearts, will come in and they will build their hive and many of them will die. And then you will have all the resources that you need for all the other hives that you set up. And I think that's, the first losses are so hard, but the first losses are a gift to all the other hives to come. The hives are like a sisterhood. You know, they're not, animals don't mind dying. I mean, I learned that in the humane movement when I had to euthanize dogs and cats for years. Animals don't mind dying. They don't have a fear of death. They don't have all that stuff that we do. So when the beehive expires, you know, we're, we're the ones that are saying, woe is me, the hive's not. And we believe that, that because bees are so sensitive, uh, the thoughts that you send to them matter. If you're looking at your hive going, oh my gosh, it's failing, oh, you poor girls, you're probably all going to croak. Um, this is bad energy to be sending your bees. Your bees don't send you bad energy, and, and you shouldn't come up and, and, you know, like, crap all over them with your bad energy. So you send 
hopeful thoughts. Come on, girls, you're all wise. I trust you. Whichever path you take, I trust you. And you celebrate them in whatever they do. And if what they do is leave and they're gone, you've got, they always leave you something. They leave you these gifts. And then all of a sudden, you've got all the honey you need for the next hive. And you've got all this luscious, fresh comb. And you say thank you to those bees that have passed on. Um, and in, in so far as collecting propolis or pollen or any of that, I don't take it out of any hive. Because I'm a crappy beekeeper, I have enough dead hives, so I just gather the stuff from there. Um, I'm really big on those little um, fermented pollen pellets. The bee bread is, is awesome. It's just awesome. It, it, it's even more amazing than the pollen itself. It seems that everything bees put their mouth to, they, um, they accent in a really powerful way. They put their mouths to resin, and they accent it and they make propolis, which is different from just the resin that you pull off of trees. It's because bees have touched it, bees have glandular enzyme capabilities that are unbelievable and you don't understand them at all, and they turn everything that they touch into magic. We uh, really promote letting our queens just mate naturally because uh, that's already been explain. And for many of the new beekeepers, talking about queen rearing is like, oh my god, I, you know, it's overwhelming. So we say to our first year people, you know, trust your bees. Over millennia they've been going out getting their queens bred and, and just trust that, trust that to start. And later on you may want to step in bigger and start getting the genetic diversity going in your hives and, and promoting certain bee lines that are you know, looking and feeling good. But in that first year, it's kind of overwhelming. So trust your bees. We populate with wild swarms. Okay? I, I bought one package of bees. I bought it from a guy a few miles from me who sells them and is extremely well known. And I didn't know what I was buying when I got it. He sold me a nook. He said, what type of hive do you have? I said, I have a warre. He said, oh, would you like me to put it in the warre? I know how to do that for an extra $60. I spent $180 for the package. I spent $60 to have it put into my warre. All he did was he just shook the bees off. <laughs> this is late, late June. Okay, our dearth has already started. They had no comb, they had no food, they had no nothing. And what they also didn't have, which I found out weeks later, was they didn't have a queen. He sold me laying workers. So I get home and I get them hived and they start to build their first little bits of wax. And I'm calling him saying, you know, we're all about really observing our bees. So I've got one hive that I pulled off a swarm on a rose bush in Portland, which I call the rose hive. And she's doing all that stuff where she's looking motivated. The bees that are coming out are on a mission. The bees that are coming back are on a mission. There's lots of pollen coming in. In this, my expensive high-priced hive, the bees are kind of wandering around, you know, bumping into each other on the doorway, 